When the people think of the wonders of the natural world, they're often looking upwards. They're looking through beautiful tropical or boreal forests, or they're looking at the twinkling stars in the night sky. Today, I want us to look downwards. I want us to look at lakes, streams, and oceans where some of the most amazing microorganisms on our planet live. They're called algae. They're photosynthetic. They provide the oxygen that provides 50% of the air we breathe. They provide wonderful foods that we eat like nori. They are also the potential sources of biofuels that can replace fossil fuels in our planet. Today, we're going to explore the beautiful world of algae in our lab in work that's being led by Julia Van Etten, a doctoral student at Rutgers. We're going to talk about the work she's doing on different types of algae and what they can uh, teach us about the biology of these wonderful organisms. Couch microscopy started as more of an art project. There are a lot of really interesting microorganisms that are found around us all the time. I find them in local ponds and puddles and different bodies of water. They could be right in our backyards. Many scientists know about them, but if you're not a scientist, it may be really interesting to know that there are these organisms that you can find anywhere you take a walk and that they're really interesting and important to our biology and that they're really beautiful to look at. The process of collecting microorganisms is actually pretty simple. I just take a plankton net and a jar, and I toss the plankton net into the water, and it filters out a lot of the water, and it keeps behind the solid matter, like the microorganisms and some plants. I pour that into the jar, I take the jar back to the lab with me, and then I just take a drop of water at a time, put it on a slide, and I get to be surprised by all the different microorganisms I find each time. My favorite ones to find are protists, and especially protists that live in colonies. Uh, watching different single cells work together and live in colonies gives us an idea of what life was like millions of years ago when multicellularity evolved. Last year, I was a TA for general microbiology, and most microbiology courses focus on bacteria, which is really interesting, but I study protists, which are also microscopic organisms. So the professors and I worked together uh, based on the things I post on my Instagram, and we decided to change the microscopy lab each semester to a protist lab where we collect samples from Passion Puddle and the students get to look through them and they get to identify protists and learn more about what they are. Right now I'm working with NASA on a project to help us understand how life first evolved on Earth and how it may have evolved or may be evolving elsewhere in the universe. The best way to do this is to find extreme environments on Earth that resemble those places. One example of this is the hot springs at Yellowstone National Park, where there are red algae that are living among microbes. And these red algae are able to survive and adapt to harsh conditions by stealing genes from the microbes around them, incorporating those genes into their genomes, and now they're able to tolerate high temperature and high acidity. This type of gene sharing was likely a really important factor in how life first evolved on Earth. These are some samples of the red algae called Cyanidiophyce that we work with. In this project, we collaborate with NASA, the Joint Genome Institute, and other research groups from around the world. Scientists in our lab and others collect algae from nature or culture collections and do experiments in the lab. The Joint Genome Institute sequences the genomes and transcriptomes of these algae and other microbes we want to work with so that we can study the functions that their genes encode and how they change over time. They also do metabolite analysis, which means that we are able to get a snapshot of all the chemicals produced by the cells under certain conditions. All these data help us understand how the cyanidiophyces survive under extreme conditions and how they interact with other microbes that share these environments. Even though they're called red algae, as you can see here, they're actually green. This is because the cyanidiophyces have evolved to no longer express the pigment called phycoerythrin, that gives most red algae their red or pink color, so they no longer reflect red light. Another really interesting thing that we hope to better understand through our research is why many of the cyanidiophyces can grow in complete darkness. Like all algae, they are photosynthetic, but some of the genes they've stolen from bacteria allow them to feed on sugars instead of just sunlight, so they can live in dark places like caves and happily grow in our lab with just some glucose and the lights off.